Hi, Grace. So why don't you give us a quick introduction of uh, who you are, what you do, what you're all about? Oh, great. Thanks. So I'm Grace Rahmani. Thank you for having me. Um, what I do is I work with organizations who actually want to implement decentralized processes. And what that would look like is collaborative decision-making systems. So I help them create processes and the culture in the organization. And what would be your best definition of distributed governance? Oh, so distributed governance, distributed and decentralized are two different things, but distributed governance would look like the people who are affected by a decision have the ability to make proposals and make part of that decision. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe it's important? If you're affected by a decision, you should have a part in the decision. I think that's pretty obvious. Yeah, pretty simple. <laughs> what is the most promising model or consideration for dis distributed governance? Well, we don't have very good models right now. And one of the reasons we don't have good models is because of the mislabeling of things, right? We have a system of incentivization, which is measured by money. And money isn't a very good measure of what we as human beings value. If you think about what the most important thing to human beings is, it's money. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> it's air. Okay? So it's air, and air is valued at zero. And then some people might say it's love, although they would die a lot sooner without air. But And love is valued at zero monies, whatever currency you use. So because of this mislabeling, we don't have very good decentralized systems for decision making. But if you look at probably one of the societies that had decentralized decision making systems um, was the North American Indians, which those tribes, um, they actually managed for thousands of years. And there were many, many tribes, and they did have communication among them, and they had a kind of decentralized system, and they worked within their tribes. There were decision makers, but they did have a systems of communication within them. And so those are societies we don't know very much about how they managed for so many years and had so many different sustainable societies that worked integratively with one another. What do you think are some of the biggest barriers to implementing uh, distributed governance in modern society? Well, current power structure. So they're people in power. And what we really need to start to look at is when do you get to the point, right, how do you implement something against the power structure? And that happens at the point at which you can't use money to incentivize people to hurt one another. Power over other people really is about violence. And when you get to a point in a society where people say, no, there's no amount of money that the government can pay me to police my other human beings, that's when you can actually overcome those power structures. That's why nonviolent movements work. What are some of the risks, do you think, are, uh, if some of these distributed technologies get picked up by the wrong hands or the wrong governments? Well. I don't know that there's such a thing as a distributed technology being held by a centralized organization. So you have these centralized organizations say we're going to use the blockchain. It doesn't change anything about the power structure. So I don't think that there's really anything around these decentralized technologies that's fundamentally going to help a centralized system. It's just if they shut them down, which is you know what they're trying to do with all kinds of financial regulations that they're calling those, you know, protecting investors, but what they're doing is prevent, they're protecting the current power structures. What about possible totalitarian applications of not truly decentralized, but maybe pseudo decentralized blockchains? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. What do you, can mm -hmm. you say what you mean? Uh, like being able to surveil peop all of people's financial transactions or censor financial transactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have that already today, right? Mm -hmm. We call it AML and everybody and your credit cards and all that information is completely readily available to any government that wants it. So we already have that surveillance system in place. So the question really is like if it gets in the wrong hands, and again, the wrong hands, who, I think it's already in the wrong hands. I think we can see that by the number of deaths in war that we have every day, by the amount of poverty that we have, um, the inequalities, the squeezing of the middle class. I think it already is in the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the biggest opportunities if we succeed with implementing distributed governance systems? The biggest opportunity is for us to be human and to be humane and for us to really live in a world where we don't always have the pain of having to look at somebody poor on the street or to know that people are starving and while we have plenty of food to share with them, that's the opportunity. Yeah, and with that, what's your uh, best vision for the future that you would like to live in? I'd really like to live in a 
future, when I think about a decentralized world of ecosystems that are easy to move between. So when I think about that, I think about like algae or moss or something. I know it sounds kind of weird, but like, you know, right now I'm in a community and this community is called the decentralized governance community. And there are about 50 of us here and probably worldwide, there's maybe about 500 of us. And we think of ourselves as a community. And when we're together, we have certain ways of acting and behaving. And then, you know, I'm going to go home and then I have children. I live in a community called my family and we have different ways of behaving. And so that my moving between these different communities, it really is like Matan Field's vision of these flocks of birds, sometimes I'm with this flock and sometimes with that flock, and I have multiple identities. And each one has its set of rules that interact with one another, and we have different ways of exchanging our value with one another. And I'd like to see a world where we don't have to survive. I think that if we take away people's worry about just where they live and whether they're going to pay their rent this month and, you know, if they have enough to eat. Once we take that worry away, people interact in natural ways that are really creative. I think so, too. Yeah, I'm excited mm -hmm. to see the art explosion when people can do what they would choose to do, not what they have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what movements, technologies, or people have you most excited or optimistic about the future? I would have to say Hollow and Hollow Chain mm. has me incredibly excited about what they're doing because they are looking at this rather than a permanent chain that everything is saved forever, but that only each unit saves the information that it needs to save. And that's really what I just said here. You don't need all the information about how my family functions. In fact, I don't really want you to have that. But I need that information. Well, what's acceptable in my mom's home and what's acceptable in my dad's home. So I think Holochain has a really good paradigm for how we actually function as societies and communities. And I'm very excited about that. Last right. question. What is a question you wish more people would ask you or would be curious about? How do you get great proposals on the table? Currently, the technology is focused on voting systems, all these voting systems and consensus systems. and everyone who's ever voted in their life has had a situation where they had like two really bad options. Okay, so I think this is the question they need, people need to ask themselves and they need, they, if they ask me, I'm honored, but that's the question. How do we get great proposals on the table so the voting, it's like, well, any of these would be fine. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's more about asking the right questions rather than giving the right answers in this case. Yeah, and it's about asking the right questions and having a discussion that looks at all the perspectives. If you have an open discussion, very frequently you get proposals on the table that make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to chat about before we wrap up here? That was fantastic. I could go on all day. <laughs> Do anything else I want to chat about? Yeah, here, let me give you my book. I'll read my book out loud. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks Great. for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. Cool.